Hello, Eagle Nation, and welcome to Before the Bottle, How Science Makes Wine Take Flight. I am Adriana Burnt with the EWU Alumni Office, and this evening we're going to talk about all, we're going to talk all about the science behind wine. We are so excited to have teamed up with the Departments of Geology and Chemistry to bring you a fun virtual event amongst all the other virtual events that I'm sure you're a part of, but also to help raise some money for our amazing students. Um, so first you can do that in three ways. Um, gifts of any amount can be given to the geology department if you like via the link that you will see on your screen. I'll just give it a sec in case anyone's really interested. Uh, you can also donate to the chemistry department via this link that you see on the screen. <clears throat> and or you can join the new Eagle Flights Wine Club where a portion of each membership will come back to us and will be given to the Alumni Legacy Scholarship. Um, you can get all the info on how the program works. You get the, um, via the sign up link here. Joining takes literally 30 seconds, unless your credit card is across the room, then it might take 45. Um, and if you do it by this Sunday, you'll be guaranteed to get our inaugural flight uh, that should be landing on your front porch in about two to three weeks. Um, the best part of that is that you don't have to be an alum or an employee or really affiliated with Eastern in any way to do any of those three options. Uh, we'll post those links at the end of, towards the end of this, this broadcast, as well as we'll put them in the comments on Facebook as well. So that way you can reference them and share with your friends. So let's learn some stuff. Um, I hope that you guys have your uh, favorite glass of vino with you and ready. Myself and our two presenters are enjoying wine from locally uh, Eagle-owned and operated Liberty Lake Wine Cellars. I personally am enjoying a glass of their 2017 Syrah. So cheers, everyone. And here we go. Uh, our first presentation tonight comes to you from Dr. Eric Abbey, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and Physics. He completed his bachelor's work at Whitman College in Walla Walla, after which he worked the crush at Sterling Vineyards in Napa Valley for a summer. He then began his PhD work on aromatic boron nitrogen heterocycles. I had to ask him how to pronounce all this. Um, at the University of Oregon, graduating in 2011. He has held visiting professorships at Whitman College and Central Washington University before coming to Eastern in 2013. At Eastern, he teaches organic chemistry and chemistry for health sciences. His research focuses on the fundamental science of, oh, here's the one I forgot to ask you about, Eric. Or organoborohydride? Yeah, organoborohydrides. Right? Oh, so close. Yeah, um, very, very close. Thank you. I knew there was another one. Uh, chemistry, including the synthesis of new molecules and the development of new reactions with possible applications in organic synthesis an alternative energy. That is quite a sentence. Outside of Eastern, he's a father, an avid outdoorsman, and a beer slash wine slash food slash music nerd. Um, so without further ado, take it away, Eric. Hey, there I am. Uh, okay, I'm going to try sh screen sharing again. And um, Let's just try entire screen and see what happens. Okay, can you guys see that? Can can we see that PowerPoint? Yes. Into yeah, you're good to go. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, thank you all for uh, attending. I can't tell if there's one person or a thousand person uh, people out there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to guess that one of them's my mom, and maybe there's uh, a few other people out there too. Um, I'm uh, Eric Abbey from the Eastern Washington uh, Chemistry Department. Um, pretty excited to be talking about uh, wine chemistry tonight. Uh, thank you to uh, Liberty Lake Cellars for this delicious bottle of uh, Red Mountain Cab that I'm uh, enjoying. 
Um, so I, I want to give a, a brief uh, disclaimer before we uh, dive in here that I am not a fermentation scientist or a wine expert. I'm a, a chemist who really loves wine and who has uh, worked a little bit in the uh, wine industry. So I'm going to first uh, go through a, a brief overview of the winemaking process. It's important to remember, I think, that wine is an agricultural product. So the first thing that we've got to do is uh, grow some really delicious grapes. Uh, the, the better the fruit that you put in, the better the wine that you're going to get out. Um, so so that, that uh, agricultural product, those grapes, uh, essentially makes a uh, flavored sugar water. All right. So the, the next thing we do after we grow the grapes is that we press out the juice. Um, so that gives us our, our, our fresh grape juice. And, um, you know, the, the winemaker has some decisions to make at, at this point uh, when they when they press out the juice. One of those is, is how much um, time the uh, juice spends in contact with the skin. So uh, red wine is fermented on the skins. And, and the purpose of that is to extract color molecules and tannins from the grape skins. And white wines are separated uh, immediately from the skin um, and, and fermented apart from the skin. So um, this is primary fermentation. This is the most important part. This is where we introduce yeast. And that yeast is a fungus that feeds on sugar. And that makes alcohol and carbon dioxide. So the next thing that can happen, this is an optional step, is that um, uh, bacteria can be added for malolactic fermentation. This is what converts uh, malic acid to lactic acid. This is commonly done with uh, red wines. It's uncommon with white wines except for Chardonnay. And the point of this malolactic fermentation is to provide a uh, smoother, creamier acidity. Um, and then after that um, secondary fermentation, the wine is aged. Um, and, and that's um, where the wine kind of settles out and much of the harshness of the wine kind of mellows out. Um, so with white wines, this is, you know, pretty commonly done on uh, stainless steel. Um, red wines is, is usually done with, with oak. So let's talk about the contents of a grape. So what's in this grape juice that we're getting out of of the grape upon upon the press. So grape juice is, is mostly water, so it's 70 to 85%. Um, the next biggest component is sugars at 18 to 30%. Uh, primarily, this is gr uh, gluco glucose and fructose. Um, and then the uh, next one would be acid, so 0.3 to 1.5% acid, uh, primarily tartaric and malic acid. There's some other ones as well about 1% proteins and then about 1% everything else, um, meaning esters, polyphenols, vitamins, minerals, flavonoids, and tannins. Um, so um, much of what, what is contained in this uh, presentation was uh, taken from a much longer presentation. If you want a more in-depth uh, uh, presentation, uh, check out this Chemistry of Wine YouTube video by Dr. Cook at North Dakota State University. Um, that's that's a much more in-depth kind of version of this. So um, let's talk about the anatomy of a grape. So um, at the top here are the, the grape stalks. This is kind of a woody material. This is usually discarded because of its bitter content. Seeds are also kind of woody. Um, these are discarded usually too. Uh, this happens during the, the press when the uh, wine is being pressed away from the, the fruit. Um, and then the skin. The skin yields tannins and colors. Um, so depending on whether you're making a white or a red wine, um, that, uh, that skin can be fermented uh, with the juice or, or separated immediately to make a white wine. And then the flesh or pulp, the inside of the grape is, is where we get uh, the juice for the wine. All right, so uh, let's talk about prim primary fermentation. So before we dive into the, the chemistry of this, um, I'd like you to take a look at these pictures on the right. So uh, the, the one on the top right is a picture of, of some grapes and that kind of powdery uh, coating that's on the surface. Those are all yeast um, 
yeast cells. So you've likely noticed this maybe on grapes or plums or apples, things like that. The very sort of light kind of white powdery um, coating. Those are yeast uh, yeast cells that live on the surface of, of that fruit, and they're there to try and eat that sugar. Uh, on the bottom right is a uh, electron microscope picture of uh, those yeasts. So you can see they're you know two to four microns. Um, so the, the job of the yeast is to eat this sugar, and that process is fermentation. And so for every sugar uh, carbohydrate molecule that they eat, they spit out two molecules of ethanol, which is what we know as alcohol, and two molecules of carbon dioxide. Um, so if you ask me, this is a pretty good investment because um, the, uh, you know, for every sugar molecule you put in, you get two alcohol molecules out. Uh, I like alcohol more than I like sugar, so I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, as this happens, um, we go from about 1% sugar dissolved in the water to about 0.55% alcohol uh, dissolved in the water. Um, so um, the solution gets less dense as the fermentation happens. Um, so a winemaker will follow this process with a crude tool called a hydrometer, which basically floats in the fermenting juice and um, will give you a rough estimate of the density of that, um, of that uh, fermenting juice. So it gets less dense and a winemaker can monitor that fermentation process um, by simply looking at the, at the density of that, um, that, that wine. Um, so uh, our primary uh, sugar molecules are, are glucose and fructose that are, that are shown here at the bottom. There's some other kind of minor sugar components, um, but, but th these are the main two that that, um, that yeast is eating. So um, a winemaker has control over how much residual sugar is, is left. This is what people refer to as the dryness of a wine. So a wine that's very dry would have very little residual sugar. So there's some things that a winemaker can do to stop this process early and leave a little bit of sweetness uh, in the wine. So this secondary fermentation that I alluded to, this malolactic fermentation, this is done by a different microbe, right? So microbes are getting kind of a bad rap in this, in this pandemic, but you know, if it weren't for microbes, we wouldn't have wine and cheese and, and beer and, and bread and things like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. As far as I know, viruses are not involved in the winemaking process. So um, malic acid is this, this acid on the left here. Um, this is kind of sharp and acidic tasting, somewhat associated with green apple notes. Um, so a winemaker will pitch lactic acid bacteria into the fermenting juice and that will turn the malic acid into lactic acid and another molecule of carbon dioxide. So this is desirable because lactic acid is uh, more kind of rich and buttery and not as sort of sharp and acidic tasting. So again, most red wines um, and Chardonnay will go through uh, malolactic fermentation, but um, you know a lot of sort of neutral white wines uh, will, will not be. So, um, you know, in, in modern winemaking, both the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria are added by the winemaker. Um, but, you know, it's important to remember that uh, people have only known about microbes for, you know, since about the 1800s, and people have been drinking fermented beverages for thousands of years. So that yeast that we saw on the skin of the grape, that will automatically turn uh, fruit juice into alcohol. And uh, you know, if you have lactic acid that's colonizing an oak barrel, you might automatically get some, some uh, lactic acid bacteria doing malolactic fermentation. So uh, let's talk next um, about wine flavors and aromas. Um, one of the principal components of the, the, the nose and, and much of the flavor of a wine is, is these volatile esters that are produced by yeast during fermentation. So the type of yeast used, the temperature and, you know, the makeup of the grape, the terroir contribute to uh, the esters that are formed. So um, this is a organic chemistry reaction where a carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol to make an ester, right? So these two things join together and they make an ester. So if you're wondering what I mean by R, 
Um, R is basically a organic chemist way of saying this is a big carbon containing group that I'm too lazy to draw. So this could be a small group or a big group. And then R2 is a different group that's on there, but they generally have this kind of main structure. Um, so esters are responsible for much of the fruity flavors in wine um, and the fruity flavors in fruit and lots of other different things. Here's some examples of some simple esters. Uh, one is ethyl acetate. Um, this is what's in nail polish remover. Not real desirable, but in very small amounts can be a good thing. Uh, isoamyl acetate, generally associated with banana flavors. Uh, if you're a fan of Belgian beers or you know Bavarian Hefeweizens, you know isoamyl acetate well. And then uh, the one on the right would be phenethyl acetate, which is uh, kind of you know rosy kind of aromas associated with, with uh, food and wine. Um, in addition to the esters, um, there are a number of other various categories of, of molecules that are responsible for wine flavors and aromas. One is these uh, molecules called methoxypyrazines. Pyrazines, this six-membered ring that has this two, these two nitrogens in it, and then there's uh, this methoxy group on there and some various type of substitution on that ring. These are what we would associate with kind of green flavors in wine, herbaceous, grassy, bell pepper, asparagus, things like that. Um, next would be the, the monoterpenes. This is a huge class of molecules that's present in all kinds of different plants. Um, so uh, things like geraniol, linalol, nerol, these are very sort of floral aromatic components. They're found in all kinds of different plants, uh, ranging from hops to marijuana, to citrus, to pine trees, to lots of different spices and things like that. Uh, next, the, the norisoprenoids. Um, these would be things like uh, vanillin, damascenone, zingarone, um, spices, raspberry, vanilla, rose oil, things like that would be common flavors associated with this class of molecules. And the last class would be these uh, sulfides or mercaptans. These are organosulfur compounds and they're really, really strong. Like very, very tiny amounts of these are, are very, very smelly. And so these are oftentimes, um, you know, undesirable traits in a wine, but in very, very tiny amounts, they can be a good thing. So, you know, if you've smelled rotten eggs or rotting vegetables, cat urine, tropical fruits, uh, or rubber, uh, these are likely, uh, you know, organosulfur compounds. And, and again, very tiny amounts of these are, are kind of good things. You know, lots of people like stinky cheese and stuff like that. So it's all about what you like in, in, in the thing that you're consuming. Uh, on the right are some kind of funny wine labels that take advantage of some of these uh, maybe undesirable uh, traits or, or, or desirable, depending on, on who your audience is. We have a cat's pee on a gooseberry bush, uh, Australian Sauve Blanc. And, a, and an old fart uh, red wine. Um, so, you know, uh, with, with any of these compounds, there's, there's too much of a good thing. Uh, tiny amounts of them in balance can, can lead to, you know, pretty desirable wines, depending on what you like. All right, let's talk about uh, preservatives and, and the, uh, the aging process. So um, when wines are aged on oak, that's French and American oak, they're valued for, for you know, different properties. Those are generally used with red wine, some Chardonnay, some other whites. The inside of these barrels is, is toasted uh, and, and, and makes the inside of them black. Um, the toasted oak imparts tannins as well as uh, lactones, vanillin, and, and smokiness to a wine. So these are the three classes of molecules associated with that. Um, so. Uh, on the left here is this oak lactone. This is a cyclic ester. So you'd experience maybe coconut or vanilla type aromas from that oak. Uh, the, the vanillin's pretty self-explanatory. The vanilla-y aspects uh, imparted to wine from oak. And then uh, these guayacols, um, kind of smoky, burnt bacon uh, flavors um, that I kind of associate with a lot of like Washington Syrahs and things like that. Um, so um, sulfites are, are the second, um, uh, the, the, the second uh, class of molecules. 
um, that, that are added to, to wine. So, so these are a preservative. They kill bacteria and native yeast um, and uh, also accelerate the, the breakdown of tannins so they can make the wine age uh, more quickly and in a more desirable fashion. So sulfites are, are naturally formed in wines, um, but um, they are also added by winemakers um, to increase the, the sulfite levels to get these desirable properties of sulfites. So um, commercial wines will have sulfite levels of 10 to 40 ppm, but even wine with no added sulfite will, will have some, some sulfites present. Uh, a winemaker will add potassium metabisulfite um, and then that reacts with the acid to make uh, SO2. Um, so, you know, a lot of people say they have issues with sulfite. Maybe they say it gives them headaches. But in general, sulfites are a good thing, especially if you like wine that has aging potential. We wouldn't be able to age wines the way that we currently do um, with, uh, without um, added sulfites. So let's talk about tannins. So tannins, um, you've probably heard people talk about um, tanning animal hides. Uh, this is the same class of molecules. So tannins refers to uh, wood tannins. Um, they're extracted from all kinds of woody uh, plant material, skin, seeds, stems, uh, and can also be imparted by oak barrels. So on the right is, is tannic acid. Um, you know, so this is a pretty big molecule. It's got a carbohydrate at the center, and then these, uh, these phenolic compounds attached to it. So tannins are a big class of, of, uh, of polyphenolic compounds. And uh, you've probably heard this word before if, you, if you've been wine tasting. This is really responsible to the kind of bitter and astringent flavors that uh, contribute to what people refer to as mouthfeel. So if you feel that kind of dried out uh, feeling on your tongue, maybe astringent flavors, that's, that's these tannins. One of the things that tannins do during the aging process is that they'll bind with proteins that are in solution and cause those proteins to drop out, um, or they can uh, polymerize and, and drop out and become less bitter. So um, the reactions of tannins is important in the aging process. And um, you know when I say the word uh, phenol, uh, phenol is this, this benzene ring with an oxygen, an OH group on it. Um, these are commonly uh, found in lots of different antioxidants. You know, maybe you think of antioxidants as having health benefits, keeping you from getting cancer, stuff like that. But antioxidants also help to preserve things. So um, these types of phenolic molecules help um, the wine keep, help prevent the wine from oxidizing. So they, they, they are a preservative in the wine. Um, so let's talk uh, next about wine color. So most of the color from a wine, uh, most of the color in a wine comes from the grape skin. Fermentation in the presence of grape skin imparts the red color. When uh, a winemaker is making a, a white wine, they separate that from the skin immediately so that it doesn't get any red color. And though white wine is usually made from white grapes, you can actually make white wine from red grapes if you separate the juice from the skin immediately. So on the right, I have three different wines that are all made from Pinot Noir grapes. So if someone says Pinot Noir, you probably think of something deep red like this bottle on the lower right. Um, but um, you could also make a rosé of Pinot Noir. So rosé, you would maybe uh, have the juice in contact with the skin for a short period of time, you know, less than a day to just get a little bit of red color and a little bit of tannin out. Or if you wanted to make a white wine like this Blanc de Noir, you would separate the juice from the skin immediately and you wouldn't get any uh, red color imparted to that. So um, the, the color molecules um, are, you know, the red color is primarily from this class of molecules called anthocyanins, which I'll talk about more in just a sec. Um, these are pH dependent. So purple, red, blue colors, those are from anthocyanins. The other main color molecules, this, uh, flavonoid called quercetin, which is a kind of the, what gives it the yellow color, color to, to white wines. And both of these are, um, are antioxidant type molecules. So the last thing that I want to talk to you about is the pH dependent uh, nature of the color of anthocyanins. So anthocyanin molecules, depending on their pH, will go through at least five different structural changes. 
So, you know, if, if you start at acidic pH, you know, below three, and then you start making it more basic, the color all actually change from red to pink to kind of purple to green to, to yellow. Um, and so the, the color of a wine is not just dependent on uh, amount of anthocyanins, but the, the pH of, of that. So I pre-recorded a, uh, a, a pH, um, you know, a, a, a reaction of anthocyanins across pH levels. So I'm going to play this pre-recorded uh, video for you guys. Um, it, it's about uh, six minutes long here. All right, so now what I'm going to do is a uh, pH demonstration um, on anthocyanins, which are uh, the, the pigment molecules that are found in the grape skin. That's what gives uh, red wine its, its red color. So let me walk you through the setup that we've got here. So we've got um, a burette setup. So on the left, we've got uh, 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, so a base. And on the right, 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid in the beaker is 90 milliliters of water, and behind it is a uh, Bluetooth uh, pH probe that is connected to this computer here. So we're gonna hit collect on that so we can see that the pH is sitting right around eight um, for this uh, deionized water. And then um, we've got 10 milliliters of a uh, 1986 uh, Lafitte uh, Rothschild Bordeaux here. Uh, but really any red wine will work. And so we're going to dump that into our uh, our water here. Uh, and, and the purpose of the water is just to dilute the colors a little bit just because they're so concentrated. And you can see now if you look back over at our, our uh, screen that the pH has dropped significantly because wine's fairly acidic. Now the pH is down around four. So what I want you to do is observe what happens when we start adding base to our wine. That is, bring the pH up, and we can watch that pH change on the screen. So now I'm going to open up the sodium hydroxide uh, burette and get some, some base going into there. So you can kind of see where the base is hitting. It's starting to get kind of dark and inky looking there. Um, the, it's good, the red color is kind of going away, and you're getting some kind of uh, yellowish green and now it's going very kind of dark kind of uh, blackish green color right? and so if we look back at the pH now our pH is up around 8 so we'll just keep going uh, a little bit further and just kind of observe what happens so now our pH is up around 10 and now we've got this real kind of dark kind of blackish green color so I'm going to turn the base off and then I'm going to switch burettes and watch what happens when we uh, acidify it. Okay, so I'm going to start adding hydrochloric acid now. So we've still got our kind of blackish green color. pH is starting to dip back down. And the dark color is starting to go away. You're starting to see some little bit of uh, reddish hue kind of returning and lightening it up to a sort of a yellowish red color. And now we're back to almost the start. I'm gonna restart our pH graph here. So now we're down below eight and we're almost back to our initial color here. So I'm gonna keep going here. Remember our initial wine pH was about four. Keep going here past that and, and see if we observe any color changes past the pH of four. So once we get more acidic, 
than the line was on, on its own. So now we're just crossing the four mark and you can see that wine starting to get really kind of bright in its color, um, more kind of a, a pinkish red as opposed to kind of that, that burgundy color. Um, so, so you actually do observe um, some, some changes beyond um, you know, the, the initial pH as, as you acidify it further. Right, so that's about as far as we're going to go. And I'll do one more round of, um, of base here so we can see if this is re just how reversible this process is. So I'll go a little bit faster this time. All right, so I'm adding the base now, so the pH should uh, start climbing back up here in a second. Again, if we look closely, we can kind of observe uh, little kind of inky kind of black swirls where that base is hitting. Um, pH is climbing back up. That real bright red color is starting to go away, getting to more of kind of a, a, a dull kind of blackish red. Um, and now that the red's, you know, you can see almost gone completely. Our pH is just about up to six. So we're kind of at our, our kind of blackish, blackish yellow, going to kind of a, a greenish black. And, and now our pH is almost all the way back up at eight now. So um, I, I think this is a pretty cool demonstration in that you can see that uh, these anthocyanins are pH sensitive and, and they can be used as a pH meter. They could give you a kind of a rough idea of a, of a pH of the solution because their structure changes with the pH and therefore their color changes with the pH. And, and this process is reversible. So we can just keep going back and forth and back and forth and we'll keep observing um, these color changes. So I, I think this is interesting as it relates to wine because we know wine's fairly acidic, but even with the same sort of uh, profile of, of anthocyanins, the cyanins, if you had different pH wines, you might observe a slightly different color uh, for those wines. So uh, hope you enjoyed this experiment. Cheers. All right. So um, that's all I've got for you guys. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, y'all might have. Um, yeah, um, so there was a couple oh. questions. First, I have to give a shout out to Larry, who said he wish he hadn't decided to drink every time you said the word fermentation, <laughs> which I think is really funny. Um, someone asked, um, where is it? Oh, Jean asked if it's possible to get a copy of your PowerPoint. Yes, I would be happy to share that. Um, what's the best way to share that? Do you want um, we can your email address? We can he can email you, or, or email maybe, you? maybe we can put it in a public place that that just folks can take it if they want to. Or yeah. I mean, yeah. If and 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 again to to any of you that are listening, you know, I, I just like nerding out on this stuff. So um, you know, I it, it'd be more fun if that you know after this we could just hang out and drink wine and talk about stuff that we're interested in, but that's not really yeah. happening. So, you know, if, 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 if you guys have questions about anything in general, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, have any of you email me, um, eabby at ewu, I'm on the chemistry uh, website. Um, yeah, and, and Jean, we'll, we'll post it somewhere, we'll be in touch with you and share it with you. Yeah, or, um, or, or if for some reason that doesn't happen, just email me directly, I'm happy to, to share that. Um, okay. I, and, and I'm not sure if this this was obvious, but for some reason, uh, my 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 program was kind of bugging out on me, and I had to totally share my entire screen, and it wasn't clear to me that anyone could even hear me. So if you saw me kind of looking down at my phone, I was like looking down to see if anyone was texting me saying it's not working, Eric. Yeah. So, no, anyway. it worked great. Um, the the other question we had is from Ramsey. Um, saying if juice from white grapes was kept in contact with the skin. What color would the wine be? White or question mark? It depends on the grape. So, you know, like most white wines are made from white grapes, which are sort of yellowish green in color. So they would probably still be kind of yellowish green in color. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as we saw with the, the example of the Pinot Noir, you can make a white wine from a red grape. Um, you can't make a red wine from a white grape. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can maybe make a more bitter and astringent white wine, but. Um, and what about rosés? Rosés are made from red grapes because white grapes wouldn't have those anthocyanins really in them. They're just kind of 
greenish yellow color. Um, so rosés are made from white grapes, or excuse me, red grapes, but instead of, you know, maybe two weeks of uh, skin contact, like you'd see in like a full bodied red wine, mm -hmm. you're looking at less than a day of skin contact. So really a rosé could be made from any red wine. Um, so th there's lots of different types of rosé out there that are all made from lots of different types of yeah, red grapes. Yeah, you see like you rosé of a color. Right. Yeah. Okay, one question is because the government requires certain levels of sulfites in wine sold in the U.S. They heard a rumor a while ago. Don't know. Don't know. My, my 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 guess is that's regulated, but I um, again I'm I'm not a winemaker. I, I bet the, I bet that Google could answer that question for you in under five minutes. Yeah, um, but but I don't know that. Okay, um, here we go. Oh, we're just getting more. Do you know of any base solutions that are safe for human consumption that wouldn't alter the flavor of the wine drastically? Um, wh why do you want to consume it? I don't know. And, they, they said tall order, I know, but it would be a fun party trick to well, change well, the well, so, wine. So like, like, like safe, yes. Delicious, no. Oh, okay. um, you know, people use sodium hydroxide to alter the pH of, of foods. Uh, you know, uh, baking soda is safe for human consumption. I, I haven't tried it, but I, I would bet you money that if you made a concentrated solution of baking soda and, and dumped it in some wine, um, that it would change color like pretty much immediately. And yeah, I agree that would be a cool party trick. And maybe you could even like make some bets and make some money off of that somehow. I don't know. But yeah, but it probably wouldn't taste very good. But it would probably taste salty and gross. Yeah. Okay, well, gosh, thank you, Eric. That's all obviously very interesting. Um, I'm excited to uh, really impress my mom that her favorite buttery Chardonnay is because of a malolactic fermentation. Um, yeah, Yes, something I learned. So thank you so much. Um, next pleasure. up is uh, Dr. Chad Pritchard, who is an associate professor in the Department of Geology here. He has held various jobs in the earth sciences, including with the Spokane County Soil Survey, a consulting geologist, and as an environmental regulator for the state of Hawaii. He obtained his PhD in geology from Washington State University. In addition, to studying a great variety of geological features in Washington. He's researched geothermal heat in Iceland, volcanics in Yellowstone, and land level changes associated with large Cascadia earthquakes here on the West Coast. He co-authored a book called Washington Rocks, as well as numerous journal articles ranging from hydrogeology of the West Plains, ice age floods, landforms, and UPB age determination of rocks in the Pacific Northwest. He lives with his wife and three children in Medical Lake and keeps trying to stay standing on a windsurf board during the rare free moments on a windy day. So Chad, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Let me share the screen here. And as uh, Adriana just mentioned, as a co-author of, of Washington Rocks, um, I'm gonna talk about the Washington State Geology. Is that doing that to you too? Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, let's exit. Let's re yeah, reload it and we'll see. Wasn't doing that when we did our run through, of course. No, it was not. Hey, is that looking okay? All right. So yes, we'll talk about the geology of Washington State and, and that's going to, um, and how it pertains to wine. And I'll like to there. Uh, so as we're talking uh, through the lecture today, I'll probably mention a bunch of different geologic features. Um, um, and that's going to focus in on, on the Cascade Range for the most part, but most of the Columbia plants over here. Um, and what I hope to partake on to you um, is that, that Washington State is really like a puzzle of geologic uh, unknowns for the most part right now. And it's EWU geology students that are doing actually quite a bit over in the Columbia Plateau. Um, we published quite a few papers lately um, on local geology. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so why would you care about geology of wines? Um, Eric kind of mentioned it, it's terroir. Uh, there's four major influences on terroir. There's the climate. Um, so the rain over a long period of time, how cold it is, how much the sun is shining and the temperature over long periods of time. Um, the wind and moisture and the fog and, the, and how much precipitation. 
Another one over here would be the terrain. Um, the terrain is uh, uh, the elevation, oh, uh, elevation, and if those slopes are going to be going north or south facing, that's going to be pretty important in Washington, especially when we get in the Yakima area. Um, down here, especially particularly important to geology, is the soils over here. Soils can be manipulated, obviously, as Eric pointed out, um, the, the grapes can as well. Um, but the, the rock that starts out has different variations of minerals in it, different, um, sometimes the same minerals, just different values. Um, and those are going to participate or partake uh, elements onto the wine, potentially. Um, and there's also the density of that soil is going to be pretty important for how roots can go through the soil and then also how water can go down and infiltrate into the soil and then be uptaken by the plant. Um, a lot of this, the, the concept of terroir is a little bit older. Um, we, we now know that photosynthesis actually plays a huge role. Um, and so biology is probably in there too. But let's, geology is still pretty fun. I'm just joking. I'm, there's probably some biologists out there. Um, and the last part here on terroir is the wine maker. And so here is uh, Mark right there from uh, Liberty Lake Wine Cellars. Thank you very much. And this is the wine. It'll come out in the next wine club. Uh, very tasty. I promised my wife I wouldn't drink until I, I did my experiment, though. And hopefully you'll understand why. Not that it's to um, the tradition is just quite what Eric just talked about is how the, the winemaker can alter uh, the, the wine um, by adding different materials to it. So I'll focus most on Eastern Washington wine, goings, um, which means that we'll kind of talk a lot about basalt, but there's also geologic structures. There's going to be the Cascade Mountains are going to play a huge role. Ice Age mega floods are there. Um, Lust, windblown sediment is going to be very important, especially like in the, the Red Mountain area, all, all the Columbia Plateau. Um, soils, we'll talk a little more about soils. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about bedrock. Um, and this is a photo, that was a photo right there from Cascade Cliffs, which is on the north side of Columbia, uh, the Columbia River. Um, very funny guy, Chateau de Bob, uh, used to own that. Um, so here's the Columbia River song, 16 million years old. 16 million years ago, off the east side of Washington, and especially in the east side of Oregon, um, there were these huge fissures right here. See that crack in the ground? You can actually see something that's just like that in, in Hawaii, um, where lava will pour out of these fountain out sometimes out, outside this, this fissure right here. And then over this uh, very short amount of time in geologic history, at least, this basalt flowed all the way across um, and then out to the Pacific Ocean. So you can see right here that as lava is flowing, it's going pretty slow usually. Um, this is Pahoy Hoy. You can set it on three, one, two, three, Pahoy Hoy, uh, which is kind of a ropey, slow moving lava. Inside the lava flow is pretty, pretty hot. Um, really hot. It's like a thousand degrees Celsius, probably about a thousand degrees Celsius. Um, the outside cools pretty quickly, um, making this sort of very rugged landscape, which is exactly what we have in, in uh, eastern Washington. You can see that poor lava, flow, I mean, the lava flows flowing over that poor. Uh, Burn right there, but there is ferns growing out of it. So that's going to be important as we're talking about Eastern Washington geology. Is there's glass on the outside of that? And that glass you can see through glass, right? You can see through this little shard. And the reason it's glass is because there's no bonding between the elements. Um, those bonds will trap photons, block electrons from flowing through. Um, so if it's a glass, it's just frozen ions, and it can break down the clay pretty quickly. And so it makes a very fertile soil using, um, over a very short amount of time. There's some more lava flow. If you can just imagine this happening over 16 million years ago. And it turns out EWU geology students study basalt all the time. So just a shout out to our students. I'm here to work in the Chini Fracture Zone. I'm not that far from Chini itself. Um, over in the Yakima area. And then we have some students here, Alex and Shayla, Shayla that went down to WMSU. And we can do it now at Eastern Washington University um, where we can actually analyze the, the different uh, elements that are in the, the basalt flows. And that's how we classify um, what, what kind of basalt it is. So other things associated with that basalt and, and just plate tectonics in general is structural deformation. In the terroir, we talked about terrain, the slopes and the elevations. Um, if we go out to the Yakima area, there's a Yakima foam thrust belt. So you can see the Frenchman Hills, the Saddle Mountains, the Yakima Ridge, Rattlesnake Ridge, Four Seven Hills, very classic wine place. The Columbia Hills right here, and we'll see a picture of them right there, not too short, not too long from here. Those are all caused by faulting. This is a little video I'm going to kind of scoot through here a little bit. Um, it's in Germany. We have a model just like this. Unfortunately, with COVID and the smoke, it was pretty hard for me to go and find them. Um, my video some class times, but what we can do is have a box and that box is compressing. And as you compress it, you can see that material is being thrust up over. It's called a reverse fault. Um, we'll talk about mega thrust in a second. Um, the, the rock's being pushed up and it causes a, a hilt. So, so if we look over here, 
in the, the Yakima area, we can see that there's sort of a north-south compression, um, compressing that basalt together to form these thrust faults in the hills. What's really cool and what makes like, the Columbia Plateau one of the best winemaking areas is these hills are along the east and west. East, yeah. Um, with, so they have a south facing slope. So you can get sun all day long on those grapes. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's just amazing. Um, so here's a picture if you want to look at that, those hills in a cross section and the Columbia Hills. Um, if you've ever driven on I 84 between Tri Cities and going to Portland, um, you can look up the Columbia Hills right here and see that the basalts were all at one point and then. They were compressed. Oh, you can do this at home too. It's pretty fun, especially if you had a little bit of wine. Um, and compress them together and make this thrust fault. So we end up with a rotated block in the center and much, much younger rocks being, or much younger yeah, rocks being thrust over older rocks. Um, and that causes this hill slope. Turns out that EWU geologists did a lot of research with geologic structures. Um, and this is actually the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt, where we took a rafting trip down the Yakima Canyon to look at the folding right here. And we're starting a new drone program in the geology department. And you can see that same fold right, the fold right there. And we're white water rafting down that river. Um, we do a lot of work in the whole area, just trying to get a promotion to our students because that's why we do what we do. Um, the next big geologic feature is going to be the Cascade Mountains. Um, the Cascades are going to have a lot to do with the geology in, in Washington, as you probably would guess. Um, if you don't know the Cascades, Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, and then Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams are right next to each other. Just because I am a geologist, I like to point out that if you ever on the west side, um, you hear a siren, there's a good chance what you're going to hear is a lahar warning system. And that's on these mountains right here, there's a lot of ash and sediment up on top. And a lot of times there's snow or there's, there's glaciers up on top too that will melt and rapidly cause these floods. They go down through and pick up all that loose material and it comes out as a big mud flow. If they're generated a volcano, we call them lahars. Now these are super devastating and uh, they've only really known about them since about the 80s or so. So if you've ever drove into, driven to uh, like North Bend on the way to Seattle, it's a huge wide valley that's flat. That's because it's filled in with all these lahar deposits and very, very devastating features. So if you hear that, just think about it. I know there are some students from the west side that, that have been kind of desensitized because they practice it so often, but definitely go to high ground if, if that's going to happen. Another thing that's hazardous with the volcano, boom, they blow up. Yes, there's ash ball that comes out. Um, and we can see that, that there's a huge ash ball from here from Mount St. Helens. Uh, the wind was blowing in the east and it carried all this material out. We don't have the map for the other volcanoes because thankfully they haven't erupted since we've been around here. Uh, but the ash is pretty important for wine because what happens if you look at that ash particle again it's going to be this glass it's magma that's cooled really fast all the ions are just frozen right there and they're not blocked so they can break down to clay really quickly and then rejuvenate and some people might say oh that's not true but at mount st helens after 1980 they did surveys and there's even reports coming out right now that that ash has produced this very fertile soil um We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but let's make some of our own ash, shall we? Should we blow something up? Oh, yeah. What we're gonna do right now is called a trash kino. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trap some gas. And that, that the bottle I'm gonna trap gas into is like the magma that cooled really fast, the glass. When a magma comes up through the ground, if it's really deep, it's like eight kilometers, 12 miles down below the ground surface, all the air bubbles inside of it are gonna be dissolved. Just like if you have a bottle of soda and you shake it, you put it behind your back and you give it to your brother or sister and they open it up, psh, they become dissolved, um, they explode actually, you know, in a magma, as it rises to the surface, those pressure, the pressure reduces and the gas bubbles get bigger and bigger until it exceeds the strength of the basalt or the, the, the magma that's holding it. This is actually not basalt at all. It's got a higher silica content. It's felsic material. Um, it's usually lower temperature too, and it traps in all the gas. And then we'll see what happens when it blows up. I need my gloves. One second. I've got safety glasses. All right. Take this off. We got our funnel. We got our funnel. And thank you, EWG or chemistry. Oh, they share it because liquid nitrogen. So it's coming out. It's a liquid. I'm going to pour it in here. Thank <laughs> you. 
I have enough. I gotta get some more. It's kind of getting dark. I didn't think it would get that dark. Yeah, buddy. All right. So we have our liquid nitrogen stuck in a bottle. I'm gonna cap it up. It's just like the lava kind of cooling. Traps. My kids put some balls in there. Projectile. Let's see what happens when you exceed the strength of a bottle as the gases expand and expand. Did that work for you? Did you guys see that? So that's like this volcano going up. We end up shattering the, 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 the bottle. This was a spray bottle. Um, and it's just like our ash. If we get the video back up, could we get the presentation back up? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you can see that ash or that the ash fragment right here. This is an SEM diagram right here. So it's like if you've ever seen the fly eye, there's a bunch of eyes all in the fly eye. This is 30 microns, so it's extremely, extremely zoomed up. Um, and you can see that there's all these little air bubbles in there and shattered the whole magma. Cool, trap the gas, and pull it up and shatter it. There's a lot of surface area to let that glass expose itself. Now my wife will let me drink some wine. Yeah. A beautiful wine, man. Thank you very much, Liberty Lake Cellars. All right, so where were we here? Talking about the Cascades, all are gorgeous. The cascades are not only important because of the ash component, the original fertilizer, so to speak, of the, the planet, but because of the orographic effect. Just physically being there is going to allow them to trap clouds, right? The moisture that's evaporated from the ocean, um, condensed up into clouds, and then moved out. The cascades close that, let rain fall off the west side. East side, we're all going to be on this rain shadow right here. What that allows... And I'm sorry, this picture is actually from Oregon. I'm from the Oregon coast, I'm sorry. Um, but there's clouds out there and it's the oceans, right? So um, on the east side, it allows the winemakers to control how much water gets to that grape. And that means that it probably won't mold the grapes. It also means that you can kind of stress that grape a lot because it doesn't have any water and it'll make more and more and more sugars. And that's gonna help you in the wine, right? It's all about the bricks, baby, so to speak. Okay, the next geologic feature that really altered our soil in Eastern Washington is gonna be the Missoula floods or the ice age mega floods. In the last 2 million years, there's been a lot of them. In the last Fraser ice age, um, the last couple of ten, uh, tens of thousands of years is about 40 to 80. Um, we're gonna look at this map right here. There's Missoula's about right here. And about, well, this happened many, many times, but we usually think about the last ones. Um, about 16,000 years ago was the last big, big one where the up in Canada, all the glaciers came down eh? and they went into this Purcell Trench and dammed off the Clark Fork River, pretty close to Sandpoint. And the Clark Fork River is that one, if you've ever been to Montana, it just goes back and forth, you just kind of drive it over it, and there's always construction there, but there's never anybody working on it. But it's a gorgeous territory, my goodness. Um, what happened is that dammed up the Clark Fork and it formed Glacial Lake Missoula. We very, very deep, especially in the city of Missoula, you can see strand lines if you're driving through the town of Missoula. Um, and every once in a while, either the water would lift the ice or the, the water would break through the ice, or but the ice would just break and we see back and the water would flow out in this huge, huge, I mean, you could barely out, speed, out drive um, this flood water as it rushed through Eastern Washington, carving out the scab land and exposing a lot of the basalt we have in the area. I know it's a little confusing, the basalt is 16 million years old um, and then the, the ice age floods are about 16,000. So it, it's actually not that hard. Okay. Anyways, so the, the floods come through, scattered out through the, um, through the Columbia Gorge deposit all of our soil in the Willamette Valley, why they can grow really nice pinots right now. And then the rest of that material went out into the ocean. And of course, about 400 kilometers, I think they've, they've drilled it out in the ocean off, offshore drilling. Um, this is pretty important for our area. Um, I could talk about this forever, right? But what we do have is on the um, EWU Geology Rocks YouTube page, you can look at Dr. Scott Burns, wonderful human being. Um, he just gave a presentation for our lecture series last month, and we posted it there. It's just longer, but he is so exciting and he's so in engaged, and there's just a pure history of the Missoula floods right there. If you want to think about how this actually happened, there's the, the Baker, um, 1973 Vic Baker, sort of the godfather, not the godfather, he'd be like the father, I think, um, of Missoula floods. 
um, yeah, Brett's was the godfather of it all, um, where we have these hills right here and basalt underneath it. And as this water scores out and pushes right through, um, uh, it's going to scour out and it gets deeper and deeper. And what happens, you have any sort of imperfection that flow, it's going to cause a zone of low, low velocity. It's going to be sort of the lee side of any material, low, low velocity and low pressure. And it forms these little whirlwinds. Like in a small river, you think is like a rapid, you know, a different class of rapids, right? In the Missoula floods, there's just these huge underwater tornadoes or vortices, is what we think, and they just pluck material out. When you think about how you erode material in Missoula floods, it's really hard. To, I mean, you can compress material, but we're talking about like tens of thousands of pounds per, per square inch to compress and break the salt. What, what happens though is if Missoula floods are going over, they have this, these vortices and they can pluck. The tensile strength of the salt when you pull it apart is a orders of magnitude less than the compressive strength. And so that's how we can scour out. These are cross sections right here, by the way. I'm sorry, um, where you can see the cross section of the hill right there. And as the Missoula floods keep on going through, make these deeper and deeper. Um, um, coolies and valleys all throughout the scablands right here. Um, and then after the, the glacial period, the, the ice age, the Pleistocene, and after these Missoula floods as well, there's a lot of silt and materials, broken up material everywhere, right? I mean, there's nothing growing anymore. Uh, all the material has been broken off. And um, then the winds come through and the winds pick up all of this fine grain material and blow it around. Um, this, these pictures right here from a publication that EWU worked with WSU and, and Spokane County Water Resources to publish. Um, the, the wind blows up all this material and forms these dunes. You can see these sort of, they're called parabolic dunes right there. Um, it's kind of put that pen right there. You can see they're kind of like bees right there. It's a parabolic dune and these are another parabolic dune. And this is, you can see this on LIDAR, this laser swath mapping. If you looked at an aerial photograph of this zone right here, you just see trees. Um, but we worked at USGS and, and, and other people, and they had these really high precision LIDAR of Spokane County, especially right now. So these are those dunes, and they're made up of the fine material. Um, and you can see it right here. This is very common in, in eastern Washington where the Missoula floods came through and you have the sand and gravels. Right in here, you can see some ripped up soil right there. And then on top of that, we have this fine grained lus. Why is he talking about lus still? What is going on? Lus is extremely important for wine in Eastern Washington because it's a lot of where our soil comes out of. It's wind blown, it's very fine grained. And so as we talk about that with soils, it's gonna be very fertile because it's got small particles in it. Um, the drainage is gonna be okay. More importantly, it will retain water. And when it's dry out here, it'll, it'll keep some water inside of it. Um, soils are very important when you're thinking about the wine. Yes, you can modify the wine, but as pure as the grape juice you can get, I think any winemaker would agree it's going to taste a lot better. I mean, the less you have to put a bow tie and a pig to take it to a dance, the better it is. I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. So we have this fertility. Um, so that's the ions that are exposed. Uh, the drainage, how water can, can flow through or be retained through this water retention. And then we have our pH. Just like what uh, uh, Eric just pointed out, pH is extremely important. And Scott Burns, um, also has a wonderful paper on, on how the pH in the soil is related directly to the juice um, that comes out for the wine. Uh, the pH also has to do with the bath, bath saturation. Um, and to some extent, the, the cation exchange capacity would have to do with how much organic material and how much clay is there. And that's going to be how, how these different ions, like kind of what Eric was talking about, interplay between the soil and then the, um, uh, the, the plant itself. You might be saying, well, how do plant, how does soils even form? And here's just a little quick description right here. Um, if it's not windblown or brought in by a stream, um, classically brought in, uh, the rock will fully disintegrate. This is a cross section again. Jimmy Hendricks came in and chopped the ground up. You can see it sideways right here. Um, over time, water will go down there, become freeze thaw. It turns into ice and expands, right? Um, and then also, what roots will start going down and break up the, the rock. Those chemically dissolved microbes, um, worms will come down through as they can as well. Um, and organic material builds up. And so we have this A horizon, B horizon, C horizon. Nobody expects the police to come back. It's actually the uh, medical like, fire department. Thank you for what you do. Um, and here's that soil. And the lust, again, is super important because it, it retains a lot of water. And, and here's the actual wine grain or the, the soils that came from the vineyards um, that Liberty Lake Wine Cellars uses. In the back, you can just see what they were just crushing. Um, I think they had just crushed the raw. So you can see the actual skins, kind of like what Eric was just talking about. Um, but again, look at that, it's super fine, very, very fine, and it's gonna allow um, more exchange between the plant and the soil. If you have any more interest in web soil, or the so in, in soil and, and how it's mapped, there is a great website, um, the Web Soil Survey, the USDA, 
put out. Um, where you can actually zoom into where you live. You can zoom into wherever you want to, really, in the United States, and see what kind of soils are there. And things like the cation exchange capacity, how much sand, you know, how much coarse sand is in there, how much clay, very, very fine particles are in there. Um, it's kind of fun. And it turns out I was actually in the soil survey for Spokane County, and that's one of the main reasons where I kind of wanted to put that geology and line together. All right. Oh, it turns out that EWU geology students do research in the mega floods, less and, and in soils as well. Um, here's a bunch of our students out looking at sand and gravel. Um, some, some, a lot of our students have been working on engineering geology a lot. And so this is how we test the strength of, of uh, soil right here. Um, Missoula flood deposits are, are more recently retired. Dr. John Buchanan and, and Lourdes Garcia no, no, um, all helped with a, a great paper that just came out as well. So this is why they have different American viticulture areas. What they've talked probably a lot more about AVAs is because that's their water. And a lot of this goes back to actually like probably one of the best geology wine guys in the world. Or not, well, probably the world. I don't know. Um, Alan Basaka, he used to teach soils at U of I and now he owns a bunch of wineries. Um, and he he's, gives great presentations as well where he can bring the wine from his vineyard um, and show you how one vineyard that's got more stress and one that's got less, it's got the same rootstock, it's got the same plant, same year they were all planted. Um, and the one that's stressed the most is gonna have the most full body and just have the most um, of the wine. Um, kind of like this Liberty Lake wine, it's pretty good. So these AVAs are pretty important. So I'd like to at seven o'clock and the, the fire department's going off. So. I'd like to say thank you very much. Here's a picture of our wonderful students. If you have any questions at all about geology or anything, uh, feel free to email me at cpritchard at ewu.edu. Again, just like Eric, I'm on the website. I'm the chair of the department, so I should be pretty easy to find. Um, and here's just another picture right here of the, the, the AVAs. It's kind of a nice way to think about the way the different groups of wines and the different flavors you have. I talked a lot about basalt. I could talk more um, about, you know, like Lake Chelan, especially down in Walla Walla and the Blue Mountains, you start picking up some older rocks. And the older rocks are fascinating because if you go back 150 million years ago, we'd be stomping around in the ocean essentially right here. We'd be a lot further uh, to the east and the end of the south as well, if you think about it with plate tectonics. Um, but I think I'll, I'll just say thank you so much and, and I hope you enjoyed it. I, I really appreciate um, the EWU Alumni Association uh, for, for hosting this and Eric for, for joining us. And, and if, yeah, if you can, please feel free to, to support our wonderful students. Uh, they do a lot of great research all at Eastern. I mean, it doesn't matter what department, geologist, best. No, uh, but yeah, this year is slim. So, so if you can help our students at all, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great evening. Great, well, thank you. Oh, we, we do have a few questions. So before okay. uh, we go, yeah, Chad, someone, uh, John Allen asked, where did lava first come out of the ground? Where the lava first? Um, so down Steens Mountain is where the lava first started pouring out. And that was pretty close mm -hmm. to 17 million years ago. Oh, well, look, Ramsey, Ramsey, Ramsey was right, right below that. I didn't even see it and said that. So they got it oh, right. Yeah, Ramsey's awesome. She's alumni. Yeah, Go Ramsey. yeah she's on it. I was going to say, and one then, of <laughs> um, And then Eric, Jean asked, when making homemade wine, how long can you age a bottle? Depends on the wine. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer. One, I've never made wine at home and two, like any wine, it, it depends on, you know, is it a red wine? Is it a white wine? Did you add sulfites? You know, what's the acidity? It's just like food and wine and beer are such complex chemical systems that, uh, you know, unless you really have a feel for that thing, um, trying to answer that, like, w without actually running the experiment is certainly beyond my capacity. I mean, I, I, I guess what, what I would say is make a whole bunch of bottles of it and try some every six months. And, and that will give you the answer to that question. Run the experiment. It will be an enjoyable one. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, this was just so great. You know, uh, Ch uh, Chad, you should know we were uh, texting with um, my boss, Lisa, and her her seven-year-old walked in right at the time you were about to do your trash cano, and at the end was wanted you to do another one. He was screaming for another. So I think it was a big hit. You, you got more like, liquid nitrogen? I got some. <laughs> yeah, you guys want to do one more? It's almost sunset. Uh, should we do one more? Yes. Time? Okay, let's do it real quick. Okay, one more. Trash cano. 
Yeah, another one for Hudson. Don't tell my wife. Does anybody have a wart? No, that's a horrible joke. Horrible joke. Okay, here we go. It's got a lot less water. This one's got a lot less water in it, so less overburden pressure. Let's see what happens. There you have it. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much, both of you. I mean, who knew there was so much science behind a bottle of wine? Um, I certainly didn't. Uh, it was so great just having all, you both on and giving us all, all of the information. And I hope everyone watching enjoyed it. And the next time that you are enjoying your favorite glass of wine, that you really appreciate everything that goes into it. Um, again, if you're watching tonight, thank you so much for sticking with us. We hope you really enjoyed it. If you'd like to support uh, the Eastern students and their continued success and continued awesomeness that Chad, um, Chad demonstrated, any amount, a donation of any amount can be made to either the geology department at this link. I'll pause for a second in case anyone wants to write it down. Uh, the chemistry department at this link. Uh, and, or you can join our, uh, our first ever wine club, Eagle Fight Flights via this link. And a reminder that if you join by this Sunday, the 20th, uh, you're guaranteed pretty much that you will be on the list for our inaugural, inaugural shipment, which goes out really soon. Um, but you can join the wine club anytime the next shipment is, um, scheduled for spring. Um, we will put all the co we will put the links to all three in the comments just so everyone's aware. Um, and then last but not least, if you're an alum, make sure that you stay in touch with us with the uh, Alumni Association. Check out our new website that got a really cool facelift at ewu.edu slash alumni where you can find information on our future events, both virtual and hopefully in person in the near future. And this includes information on our pivot from homecoming to what we're now calling Eagle Strong Weekend, which is October 9th through 11th, uh, during which that weekend we are having an exclusive wine club member only event. So make sure you sign up so you get an invite to that. You can also update your information. You can check out all the other really great programs that we have and so much more. So we thank you guys so much again, Chad, Eric, thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. Cheers. Have a yeah. lovely, uh, happy yeah. and fun Go Eags. Thanks, guys.